Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Um, I am Mascaram, uh, Dr. Mascaram Gabriel-Xavier, Assistant Clinical Professor and Director of Inclusion and Community Engagement in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University. I feel incredibly privileged to be able to provide timely and important programming such as today's lecture and want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, I know it's uh, at the end of the semester and uh, really tough to fit different events in, so I appreciate those of you who were able to join us. Um, welcome to the seventh lecture of our new colloquium series titled Toward a Liberatory Theory and Praxis, and the last lecture for this academic year. Um, this monthly series aims to highlight the work of contemporary scholars belonging to identities and traditions marginalized within mainstream Western academia who, through their work, confront neocolonial power structures and challenge long-standing norms of knowledge production. Um, it was born out of a demand from our graduate students for exposure to more critical scholarship that is relevant to their lived experiences and the times in which we are living. Specifically, I want to thank um, Nalubega Ross, Tisa Lowen, Aliyah Hoff, and um, newly minted PhD, Dr. Anais Roque, um, who worked with me to conceptualize this series and establish its parameters. Um, I also want to acknowledge Shesk leadership for supporting and sponsoring the series, um, specifically our unit director, Dr. Chris Dojanowski. Uh, we will be back again next fall with a whole new docket of scholars and exciting talks. So keep an eye out um, towards the end of the summer for, inform for information on those talks. Before I introduce today's speaker, I wanna cover a few housekeeping items. Um, please note that this presentation and the Q&A to follow is being recorded. Um, you, the audience, will not be visible in the recording and all of your mics will be uh, muted. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we will be leaving time for questions after the talk and we are asking that you write your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to vocalize the question yourself, rather than have um, our speaker read it out, um, then um, put, please write ask live in parentheses um, at the end of the question um, that you submit. And um, we can call on you and unmute your mic so that you may do so. Okay, so without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Karma R. Chavez. Um, Dr. Chavez writes, teaches, and uh, currently serves as, as chair in the Department of Mexican American and Latina Latino Studies at the University of Texas at Austin, um, where she also holds several affiliate faculty appointments. Um, working with colleagues across UT's culture, uh, College of Liberal Arts, Dr. Chavez has been helping to create a new initiative called GRIDS, Gender race, in indigeneity, disability, and sexuality studies, designed to foster relations with scholarship that is primarily informed by queer color theory and women of color feminism, Dr. Chavez is a rhetorical critic who utilizes textual and field-based methods. She is interested in studying social movement building, activist rhetoric, and coalitional politics. Her work emphasizes the rhetorical practices of groups marginalized within existing power structures, but also attends to rhetoric produced by powerful institutions and actors about marginalized folks and the systems that oppress them. Uh, my apologies for the voice of my toddler in the background. <laughs> um, in the summer of 2019, Dr. Chavez helped to create the new Michigan State University Press Journal, Rhetoric, Politics, and Culture. She has published three co-edited co-edited volumes, uh, a book of interviews called Palestine on the Air, published by the University of Illinois Press in 2019, and monographs um, titled, um, the first titled Queen Mi sorry, Queer Migration Politics, Activist Rhetoric and Coalitional Possibilities, also published by the University of Illinois Press in 2013, and her latest book and basis of her talk today, The Borders of AIDS, Race, Quarantine, and Resistance, which will be released by the University of Washington Press this upcoming June, but is currently available for pre-order on Amazon. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Karma Chavez. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm gonna put up a, uh, share my screen here real quick. 
see how good I am at tech and if my students have to suffer. Um, so, so I'm going to jump right in and then I'll say a, a, a few of opening uh, remarks. Uh, but just to note, there is an accessibility copy for today's lecture at that um, web address there. So you can, if, if you'd like to read along, uh, feel free to go ahead and go to that site. Downloaders of the dome picture. So I'm going to jump right in, and then I'll say a few uh, welcome remarks. Many are comparing HIV AIDS and COVID 19, but noting the similarities between AIDS, originally known as gay cancer or RID, a related immune deficiency, and Trump's decision to refer to COVID 19 as a Chinese virus. Other comparisons abound, even as some rightfully caution about the limitations. Analogies. There are some important ways that AIDS can help us understand COVID-19 that do not require analogies, but instead can inform the ways we understand the deep logics of white supremacists, anti-black, settler colonial nation states like the United States. AIDS reminds us that contagious or communicable diseases often use as an opportunity to marginalize the marginalized. More to the point in the U.S. context, black communities suffered in wildly disproportionate ways from AIDS because it exacerbated existing violences in terms of racism, poverty, and homophobia. The same is true with COVID-19, as Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities face more dire impacts. The Centers for Disease Control reports that, <laughs> excuse me, Blacks and Indigenous folks are five times more likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19 than whites, and Latinx folks of all races are four times more likely to be hospitalized. As of the end of May 2020, when this particular written, the black mortality rate was 3.57 times that of white mortality. As with AIDS, disproportionate death and suffering must be contextualized within existing structural disparities so that racist explanations about biology and personal responsibility do not inform public health and political response. Inevitably, AIDS teaches us racist responses will hold court in the mainstream. Politicians cannot be counted upon to address the disparate death count. Civil dialogue and respectability politics are inadequate defenses. Agitational resistance must be the mandate of the afflicted. But until the police murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis tore many away from homes and essential contact only and into the streets, the highly contagious COVID-19 seemed to make such progressive and radical resistance too dangerous to risk. Occurring on Memorial Day, the end of a long weekend when many U.S. states also chose to lift stay-at-home orders and, quote, open for business, the weeks following saw record infections, hospitalizations, and deaths in those places. Although Dr. Chavez, my yeah. apologies for cutting you off. Um, the, no. the, the, the audio is not really, um, is, is really hard to hear. Some people are commenting in the, in the I think maybe it's the earbuds. I think it was fine earlier when we first spoke, so thank you. Okay, great. Sorry about that, y'all. All right, is the screen still sharing? We good? Yes. All right. Okay. So um, thank you for letting me know that. So, so I'll, I'll start a little bit back. So uh, occurring on Memorial Day, the end of the long weekend when many US states also chose to lift stay at home orders and quote unquote open for business, the weeks following saw record infections, hospitalizations and deaths in those places. Although the research appeared to be mixed at the time I wrote this, it seems that in many cities, the protests against police did not contribute to the increase in COVID-19 cases, perhaps because protest organizers encouraged participants to wear masks and take care of each other. AIDS is also a reminder that dangerous disease is always an opportunity to foment anti-migrant and xenophobic sentiment. From the moment US mainstream media and politicians had awareness of AIDS, fingers pointed to places outside US borders and migrant communities within them like Haitians. As these pages of my book reveal, calls to quarantine people living with HIV and AIDS resulted in criminalization of numerous, mostly black HIV positive people and the ban on HIV positive migrants coming to or regularizing in the United States. Such moves are unsurprising because the United States is founding in what I call alienizing logic. 
And while that logic does not only implicate migrant communities, what May Nye calls alien citizens become targets too, racialized migrants are a perpetual scapegoat in US history. When Trump uses COVID-19 as a rationale to close US borders to the movement of people or demonize the Chinese, it's important to remember that he drew from a long playbook that preceded him. As people of Asian descent in the United States report upticks in hate crimes and bias incidents, which of course we saw in stark terms in, in March, it's equally important to recall that disease has long been used as an opportunity to target those perceived as foreign for political ends. Furthermore, reports of migrants languishing in detention centers with lack of clean water and personal protective equipment as COVID-19 runs rampant among them is eerily reminiscent of the detention camp on Guantanamo Bay that held supposedly HIV positive Haitian migrants for nearly two years without recourse. The time period in which my book ends is 1993 with the release, release of all the Haitian migrants from Guantanamo after a court order. At that time, 182,275 deaths had been attributed to AIDS in the United States and prospects for a vaccine were bleak. When I wrote this, which is the prologue to my book, the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center reported that 163,463 COVID-19 related deaths had occurred in the United States and 700,000 worldwide. And of course, here we are just about a year later uh, and we know those numbers have only nearly tripled. I have no idea how to make sense of either of those numbers. Perhaps the truth of the matter is that AIDS has less to teach us about COVID-19 than it has to continue to teach us about the deeply embedded, I would argue, foundational flaws inherent in these alleged United States. So uh, I just want to take a moment and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, as I mentioned, that was from an excerpt from the prologue of my new book, The Borders of AIDS, which you uh, can see on the screen here. Um, I'm very grateful to Meski for the invitation uh, today. It's always good to be uh, back at ASU where I got my PhD, even if uh, I'm not actually back, just back virtually. Um, and thanks also to Brian for all the technical support and uh, for everybody who made this possible. I know how much work it is to, to bring people out. And so I'm really grateful for your labor and um, for the opportunity to, to be here talking with you uh, today. So um, my book will be out in June. Um, and in the remainder of my remarks today, I'm gonna share just a few more excerpts from my book. And so I'm gonna start out by telling you a little bit more about the book, and then I'll turn some sustained attention to some analysis from the conclusion of the book uh, before giving you a little excerpt from the epilogue. Uh, this won't be then a kind of conventional talk, uh, just delivering a paper, a chapter, uh, but I hope it gives us some things to talk about. And um, I also hope that you don't identify any fatal flaws because the book will be out in two months. Um, and hopefully maybe you'll be inclined to read a little bit more, uh, but uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. So uh, let's go. A person wearing a Ronald Reagan mask, black suit, and long yellow rubber gloves sat casually with his ankles crossed on top of the cab of a beat up pickup truck, driving through the streets of New York. Guards in army green uniforms flanked the truck, donning the same gloves and what looked like N95 masks. The truck pulled a makeshift concentration camp constructed of bars and razor wire. A watchtower protruded from the center of the camp with yellow images of Reagan's face on all four sides, peering out like Big Brother. A multiracial group of prisoners looked out the, to the street from between the bars and barbed wire as other marchers walked slowly beside them, carrying signs proclaiming, silence equals death. This prescient performative protest at the 1987 Pride March was the brainchild of the nascent AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, or ACT UP New York which wanted to make a powerful statement about AIDS at the annual event. Whether ACT UP members were aware, it's unclear, but just weeks before the Pride March, the US Senate passed a ban on HIV positive migrants, preventing them from coming to or illegalizing within the United States. Some four years later, the reality the float foreshadowed would become into existence 
as the United States constructed a quarantine camp for intercepted HIV positive Haitians who fled political violence after the overthrow of their president, Jean Bertrand Aristide. Although ACTIP could not have known that they were actually predicting a future for some HIV positive people, <clears throat> the ominous float made a statement about the severity of the situation for some people living with AIDS, not just because opportunistic infections could be deadly, but for the ways the US government would use the disease as an opportunity to alienize already, already maligned people like Haitians and homosexuals. In a nation state like the United States, which is founded on the creation and maintenance of a populace, a citizenry that is definitionally expulsive, exterminative and exclusionary, whether by genocide, lynching, the plantation, the reservation, the ghetto, the internment camp, the prison, the hospital, quarantine, ban or deportation. Disease becomes one of many opportunities to express this alienizing logic. What I describe as an alienizing logic references a structure of thinking, which insists that some are necessarily members of a community and some are recognized as not belonging, even if they physically reside there. Thus, the alien outside is not a part of a simple dichotomy constituted by a firm boundary between two easily identifiable positions. Disease has historically been an opportunity to express the state's alienizing logic when associated with particular people. In the US context, black, migrant, queer, trans, indigenous, poor, prostitute, of color. Regardless of whether they possess US citizenship, these are alienized people, as in they are or easily can be made alien to the nation state. My book is about two expressions of alienizing logic, quarantine, and ban as they manifested in the early days of the AIDS pandemic in the US from 1981 uh, to 1993. So I'm just gonna go back to the title slide for a minute. So again, if you need that accessibility copy, it's easier to follow, please go ahead and go pick that up. So my book unfolds through five body chapters divided into two sections with each chapter addressing an important part of how AIDS created an opportunity to animate alienizing logic. In the first section, Alienizing Logic and Structure, I emphasize how people with power who frame issues and make decisions utilize disease as an opportunity to enact this alienizing logic. This focus helps to see the development and perniciousness of this logic and how it manifests historically and in relation to HIV and AIDS. So chapter one maps the development of quarantine laws in the US in relation to racialized US citizens, migrants, and supposed sexual deviants. Chapter two explains how the historical precedence of the first chapter manifests in kind of the perfect storm of HIV AIDS in the US and how calls to quarantine play out largely on the backs of black sex workers. Chapter three explores the way alienizing logic, the alienizing logic of quarantine morphs into what I call national common sense and US immigration law as some of those most adamantly in support of nationwide quarantine in the US become key architects of the ban on HIV positive immigration in 1987. In the second section, which I call re resisting alienizing logic, I shift attention to how mostly queer AIDS activists respond to and resisted alienizing logics as they applied to migrant communities who may or may not have also been queer. Now, many books have addressed queer AIDS activism, marking AIDS as the catalyst to what becomes contemporary queer politics. Most of those books focus on US citizens battling on behalf of US citizens. For me as a scholar of queer and migration politics and coalition and someone who knows how central questions about migration were to thinking about AIDS, telling a story that puts queer politics and migration politics into productive conversation is of vital importance in order to understand another crucial dimension of the history of AIDS in the United States. Given the power of alienizing logic in constituting the expressions of quarantine and ban, complicating the important historical archive and scholarly record of queer AIDS activism with an examination of how queer AIDS activists battled on behalf of another alienized group of which many were not a part, migrants, offers important insights into the texture of struggles against AIDS and the possibilities for innovative coalitional moments. So chapter four explores the boycotts and protests of the International AIDS Conferences in 1990 and 1992, which were both scheduled to take place in the United States, but because of that HIV ban, they were boycotted. 
And then the last chapter considers Haitians' distinct relationship to HIV and AIDS through the lens of AIDS activist media. In that chapter, I argue that AIDS activist media makers provided some of the most accurate and informative reporting on the so-called Haitian connection in the early days. And later, I show how queer and AIDS activist media makers became among the most prominent in documenting fights against the US government's extreme application of alienizing logic as it was used, uh, as it used Guantanamo Bay uh, uh, to detain hundreds of allegedly HIV positive Haitian migrants. So that's a brief overview of the book. What I'm now gonna do is I'm actually gonna jump all the way to the end uh, and I'm gonna pull some selections from my conclusion so you can kind of see what the stakes are of the book, um, which I, I think are, I, I hope are really salient in this historical moment. So let's jump here to uh, probably have maybe some of you have seen this um, book. So this book includes this quotation. So I'll just read it real quick so we all have it. The mass immigration so thoughtlessly triggered in 1965 risks making America an alien nation, not merely in the sense that the numbers of aliens in the nation are rising to levels last seen in the 19th century, not merely in the sense that America will become a freak among the world's nations because of the unprecedented demographic mutation it is inflicting on itself, not merely in the sense that Americans themselves will become alien to each other, requiring an increasingly strained government to arbitrate between them, but ultimately in the sense that Americans will no longer share in common what Abraham Lincoln called in his first inaugural address, the mystic cords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land. And that when the time comes to strike those cords, no sweet sound will result. So I introduced this quotation from the 1995 national best-selling xenophobic screed, Alien Nation, because my identification and discussion of the alienizing nation uh, in my book directly intervenes in the persistent and persistent, persistent and pernicious logics alien nation inhabits and promotes. These logics remain just as powerful now as they did in 1995, as they did when the first settlers arrived on the continent. They have always been. Brimlow's book is nothing special. It's part of a genre of books authored mostly by white men that sound various alarms about subjects like affirmative action, immigration, or family values from a racist nativist point of view. They're usually trash to read, arrogantly written, completely unreflexive, and with an unsurprisingly skewed use of facts. But what is useful about books like Brimlow's is that they highlight characteristics of the nation that are no longer polite to discuss in public, but that are absolutely foundational to and constitutive of the project of the United States of America. And we might be thinking about um, whoever, I think it was, a, she said it the other day that, you know, there was nothing here when the colonizers got here, right? When Brimlow talk, says, for example, that the American nation has always had a specific ethnic core and that core has been white, He's not wrong. In fact, he identifies precisely what the so-called founding fathers had in mind in 1789 when they extended voting rights only to white property-owning men. Or in 1790, when Congress bounded the right to naturalize as a US citizen to any alien being a free white person. Just as Brimlow puts it, the founders of the United States saw it. Of course, the manner in which people who belong to the US nation uh, enact an alienizing logics differ, but opportunities abound. Now, at its heart, my book performs a critique of citizenship and the entire project of the United States. The biggest takeaway of my book, which started out as a project about AIDS and immigration, is that Blackness, both as an area of study and as it manifests in citizenship and immigration, must be central to this critique because Blackness resides at the center of the alienizing nation and resistances to it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about uh, this point. And I'm gonna use Brimlow's fears about the alien nation as offered in this, this, what I have on the screen right now is the epigraph to the conclusion of the book uh, to hopefully generate some additional insights about the alienizing nation. So Brimlow, though an alien himself from Britain, laments a particular character of the United States becoming and potential being as a result of the 1965 Immigration Act. 
The act is generally remembered for eliminating race-based quotas, thereby opening up new possibilities for people from countries, particularly in Asia, to migrate to the United States. Now, the act did increase migration, but it did not completely liberalize immigration law, as Bruno suggests. Ethne Levade argues that because the act also ensured that nearly three quarters of legal immigrants to the United States would come through so-called family reunification, most migrant channels remain closed for anyone without desirable skills, high income, or heteronormative family already in the US. Still, it remains true that the act ended the era of formal racial quotas and opened up possibility for the United States to fulfill its promise as a nation of immigrants. Now, Brimlow understands this potential as a becoming that not only fundamentally threatens to alter the white nation, but if becoming results in being, the United States will be a freak among its peers. The use of the word freak is especially revealing of Brimlow's anxieties about the modern US nation. A freak is a monster, or at least monstrous, a word extending from the Latin monstrum, a bad omen, that which evokes fear. Rosemary Garland Thompson suggests that freak discourse is both imbricated in and reflective of our cultural transformation into modernity. She explains that freak discourse actually maps the trajectory of modernity's narrative. What was once sought after as revelation becomes pursued as entertainment. What aroused awe now inspires horror. What was taken as a portent shifts to a side of progress. In brief, wonder becomes error. <laughs> Garland Thompson and other scholars of race, gender, sexuality, and disability have discussed this mapping in relation to exceptional human bodies, particular racialized, queer, and disabled bodies. In modern times, freakish bodies are bodies in error. Although human bodies are typically the subject of freak discourse, we can also make an analogy to the exceptional national body, made transparent in the classic idea of American exceptionalism. What has made the, quote, grand experiment of these United States exceptional <clears throat> is its melting pot, its founding and revolution, its form of representative democracy, and its brand of freedom that is supposedly foreign to the European countries the settlers fled. But the grand experiment has always provoked anxiety, particularly around the purity and fitness of the national body, with so many different types of people mixed in. This exceptional national body was once a wonder, but would it also become an error? Would the experiment like Frankenstein be taken too far? Brimlow's concern about being a freak is a concern about the health of the national body. Health for Brimlow, like so many of the architects of this nation, refers primarily to race and culture. But those fears have always been simultaneously about migrant sexuality, gender ideologies, and overall mental and physical fitness for the nation. Some cultures and races and their practices and quote unquote inferior stock create disease for the nation. To become an alien nation is to become a freak nation, a nation full of freaks, a diseased nation, and a nation freakish to other modern white nations. Although this concern seems to be about reputation, it is only that in as much as the internal quality of the US nation would make it inferior to whiter, purer nations. Now, Brimlow's reliance on the racist, ableist, normative term freak further reveals this fact as we move into Brimlow's next concern for the nation itself, particularly white US Americans standing among each other in the present. If the nation is full of freaks, not only will it be inferior to other nations, but how will citizens recognize one another if they live in an alien or a freak nation? How will they peacefully coexist? The answer, of course, is that they will not, at least not without significant government intervention. If citizens are too strange to one another, the argument goes, the nation simply cannot survive. The mortal threat that is the inability to recognize oneself and their fellow citizens is, of course, a strong rationale to find ways to enact alienizing logic. This fear of survival leads Brimlow to his most significant concern, which is that if US citizens are alien to one another, they will no longer share the quote mystic chords of memory, words he pulled from President Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address, delivered in March 1861 on the precipice of civil war with seven Southern states already having seceded. seceded. This address is not Lincoln's most famous, but his words have been widely praised for their literary and epidactic quality. David Zarefsky notes that this speech is fundamentally about the question of secession with Lincoln intending to frame the situation in such a way that if a war broke out, 
the Southern states would be regarded as the aggressors. For Lincoln, the mystic chords of memory are aspirational, what he hopes for and envisions for the Union. And that hope is a sentimental appeal to remain in the Union in order to continue to perfect it, to reach the melodic harmony. For Bremlow, the mystic chords are that which exist or in his mind once existed and are in grave danger of never being recoverable again. The longing for harmony that Lincoln and Brimlow share result in what some will be surprised to see as a shared worldview. For both, alienizing logic animates their positions. Although Lincoln personally disagreed with the institution of slavery, his treatment of slavery in the speech reveals his grounding in white supremacy, which will help to illuminate why Brimlow turns to his speech, the depth of alienizing logic in the United States, and what is at stake in preserving it. Lincoln began his address by assuring Southerners that, as he had said many times before, he had no intention of intervening in the institution of slavery. His opening anticipates the president who freed the enslaved's ultimate objective, to preserve the imperfect union and implore those who would divide it to engage by other means. Just prior to what Brimlow quotes here, Lincoln pleads, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. Now Lincoln's shift from are to must is instructive here. Lincoln insists that we, the citizens of the United States, whether in the North or the South, are not enemies, but he simultaneously commands us not to be. He demands friendship in spite of, or perhaps because of his support of slavery and genocide. No matter that slavery should contradict the values upon which the United States was ostensibly built for Lincoln and for Brimlow, the alternative to holding tight to these bonds of white supremacist nationalist affection is civil war. Thus Brimlow implies that if the alien nation comes to be, it can in effect expect a civil war. This thesis insists that white racial, ethnic and cultural harmony must be preserved to prevent extreme forms of state violence. <clears throat> It's important to remember that Lincoln spent a significant portion of his first inaugural address, not only expressing his tacit support for slavery's right to exist, but also affirming the right of Southern property owners to reclaim their human property when they became fugitives. He affirmed states' rights, <clears throat> saying it did not matter whether that property was reclaimed by national or state authorities, but the law of the land must be upheld. Enslavement and capture, two of the most extreme forms of state violence, cannot feature as such in Lincoln's worldview, even as when he implores his audience that we must not be enemies, he affirms that the assurance of this alienizing right is that which will keep us, quote unquote, in union. Slavery may be a scourge in the United States and a contradiction of its avowed principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But these contradictions are not sufficient reason for us to be unfriendly to one another, to start a war. According to Lincoln, we can, we must hold that contradiction and still be whole. In fact, even when we disagree with the actions of this imperfect union, we must do the duty of alienizing. This rhetoric, the rhetoric of the union will be stronger than what we do to other human beings among us. What can and must keep the union together is a belief in the claims the union makes about itself in its constitution and declaration of independence. Thus what keeps us together, <clears throat> how we prevent ourselves from becoming alien to one another is to uphold the right to alienize, to enslave, to capture, to displace, to kill. To remain whole, we must keep alive the potential to alienize. Put simply, slavery is constitutive of us. We become a people in our, in our inalienable right to alienize. And if we take away this right, that is the undoing of this nation. We would have to become something else to alienize, whether by genocide, lynching, the plantation, the reservation, the ghetto, the internment camp, the prison, the hospital, quarantine, ban, or deportation is our engine, not just economically, but culturally, and for Lincoln, Within an alienizing nation, we must still be friends. To untie the binds of slavery would be to undo the union of friendship, and Lincoln would do all he could to keep the white 
alienizing nation. The alienizing potential toward the enslaved, the indigenous, the poor, the alien citizen of color, the migrant, is the bond required for the sovereignty of the nation, the United States, and the masters. Keeping the bond is the possibility to govern. Lincoln extends the branch of friendship on the promise of the ability to alienize, to rule over, even if we don't like it. This is the birth and the life of a nation, the homosocial reproductivity of nationhood. Although his premise defies his principles, Lincoln put aside his misgivings, assuring he would not take away the in inalienable right to alienize, to rule over, to sovereignty. Lincoln was willing to cede the blood of the enslaved in order to maintain the soil of the nation. It is sacrificial. Lincoln stakes his claim on the presumption of the vulnerability of the national body. Of course, in one obvious way, his fears made sense on the brink of civil war, but the enduring fear of the national body's vulnerability excuses, enables, and allows violence against the alienized for the sake of the greater project, the white union and all its promises. But the national body is premised on the alienizing logic and power of white supremacy, and it was and is actually not vulnerable at all. This national body was and is a vicious, powerful, unrelenting association. In part, this is because of the national body's pliability, its dexterity in order to preserve its inalienable right to aliens. Even a, even a nation that diversifies its citizenry can preserve this right to alienize because ultimately it's not dependent on being or becoming, but doing. If we move to a 21st century example, we can see how being white is not the same as doing white supremacy. The doing is invitational. You, no matter whether you are white, can do it too. You can do friendship by targeting, by alienizing the enemy. Zygmunt Bauman argues that the stranger, and we might say alien, is what blurs the friend-enemy binary. The stranger is neither friend nor enemy, but we can have friendship and avoid enemyship by targeting other strangers or aliens. In her revision of this claim, Sarah Ahmed claims that the stranger alien only becomes that by being recognized as such. The stranger is always in our midst. Thus within white supremacy, one does not have to be white to recognize another as alien. This ability to recognize another as a stranger or alien helps to illustrate the distinction between being white and doing white supremacy, a distinction that is central to upholding the alienizing nation. Doing white supremacy can legitimize one who might otherwise be recognized as a stranger or an alien. He can still do friendship. Even those recognized as strangers can take opportunities to do white supremacy, which means they have use value for the alienizing nation. In this way, to belong or to have friendship is not about identity as much as identification to an ideology through a logic of alienizing. This dynamic and therefore the power of the alienizing nation can be seen in the case of George Zimmerman, the mixed race Latino and self-appointed neighborhood watchman who killed 17 year old black youth Trayvon Martin in Florida in 2012. <clears throat> Zimmerman lynched a black youth and avoided murder, murder charge because of Florida's stand your ground law. But Zimmerman did not stand his ground. He stood our ground, the sovereign ground of the state of Florida and the United States. He did white supremacy by supposedly defending a white neighborhood against the threat of blackness. Blackness is and always has been in the United States an opportunity to enact alienizing logic in the form of capture, incarceration, and murder. Blackness creates the opportunity to do the bidding of white supremacy, even if the murder is not at the hands of a white person. Lincoln licensed the right to alienize because it is what is required to preserve the home, the proper property-owning polity. Zimmerman, though not wholly white, made good on that license. Thus, more than a century after Lincoln's affirmation of the right to alienize in order to preserve this imperfect union, the nation remains invulnerable because of the power of white supremacy and the power of alienizing logic and constituting it. What Lincoln and Brimlow fear, the breaking of bonds, are within alienizing logic virtually impossible. Opportunities will always arise and be taken in order to preserve the alienizing nation. Quarantine and ban as manifestations of alienizing logic are then as American as apple pie. 
They help to preserve the bonds of friendship among those so endowed. My book offers one instance among many that shows how the threat of the alien nation feared by Lincoln, Brimlow, and so many others is combated by the alienizing nation, the nation that operates by the logic of expulsion, exclusion, and extermination. Thus, where Brimlow is concerned about a potential state of being for the nation, I'm concerned about the nation's doing. The alienizing nation may no longer be in the midst of a civil war, but it is premised on exerting extreme forms of state violence against any of those, citizen or migrant, who do not conform to the state's white supremacist, anti-Black, ableist, heteropatriarchal, capitalist norms. The alienizing nation seeks opportunities to enact its logic, and disease repeatedly becomes one such opportunity. As ever, the people resist. The stakes for documenting our challenges and continuing to challenge the alienizing nation remain high. These logics are the very material out of which the United States was built and survives. Rather than longing for those mystic cords of memory, we must break the cords that bind them. <clears throat> so I'm gonna read just a little bit from the uh, epilogue and then uh, let's have a conversation. The statues are falling down. Well, they're not actually falling, of course. Groups of committed masked activists and not just anarchists or would be Zapatistas, but people concerned about each other's health. They've collectively used their strength to topple stone and metal memorials of racist historical figures, ranging from Confederate leaders such as Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee to colonial murderer Christopher Columbus to notorious Philadelphia Mayor Frank Rizzo. To date, Washington and Lincoln memorials remain unscathed, <clears throat> with the exception of the Emancipation Memorial, designed by Thomas Ball in 1876 in Washington, D.C., to see with a copy uh, erected in Boston a few years later. In this 19th century memorial, Lincoln dons a full suit and stands above a kneeling enslaved black man dressed only in a loincloth. Lincoln stares down at the man with one arm leaning, leaning against a platform holding the Emancipation Proclamation and the other outstretched over the man's head as if he is anointing him. The kneeling man is Archer Alexander who escaped enslavement and helped the Union Army only to be returned to slaveholders under the Fugitive Slave Act. Alexander's eyes look upward while the cuffs of the broken chains of slavery dangle at his wrists and ankles. After Harvard University is called to tear down the Boston statue and a petition with over 12,000 signatures calling for the statue's removal, the Boston Arts Commission voted unanimously to remove the statue. An activist, of course, then turned attention to the one in DC. Statue's always been controversial. At its unveiling in Washington on April 14, 1876, the 11th anniversary of Lincoln's assassination, Frederick Douglass gave an impassioned speech. Now, scholars have widely considered the speech as they have the relationship between Lincoln and Douglass, and so I don't intend to rehearse those arguments here. But what I want to draw attention to is the off-sided section that comes early in the speech, when Douglass, who had a complicated personal relationship with whiteness, proclaim that Lincoln was preeminently the white man's president. Entirely devoted to the welfare of white men, he was ready and willing at any time during the first years of his administration to deny, postpone, and sacrifice the rights of humanity and the colored people to promote the welfare of the white people of this country. Now this claim makes sense as Douglas clearly had as his delicate task, complicating his legacy his legacy by honoring that Lincoln oversaw the fall of slavery and insisting that he was no great liberator. Douglas's statement echoes Lincoln from the first inaugural address. Preserving the imperfect union was always his priority. This priority remains true of every president and most white Americans ever since, no matter the cost to black, indigenous, and other people of color. Confederate statues become an acceptable target in this regard, even as they are fiercely defended by Republicans and white nationalists because they reflect the severing of the nation. Overt racist or indigenous murderers like Columbus are also acceptable to a majority for similar reasons. US American heroes like Lincoln and founding fathers who held slaves like Jefferson and Lincoln, I'm sorry, Jefferson and Washington, generally remain untouchable. If not for the demeaning depiction of blackness in the Emancipation Memorial, it too would be beyond reproach. Contemporary black liberationists rebelling in response to yet another string of police and vigilante murders of unarmed black people 
hammer cracks in the foundations of the pedestals, not just of these statues, but the very structures that enable honoring and upholding white supremacy. And the moment I write, which was last summer, they're closer than ever before to pushing society up against what was previously beyond reproach. Not just supposedly heroic American monuments, but the abolition of police and immigration and customs enforcement, the release of the imprisoned and more. The very structures that have built the alienizing nation are, I believe and hope, under duress. All of this while COVID-19 ravishes black, indigenous and other communities of color. And while police and vigilante murder of black people and others in the United States happens with astonishing frequency, perhaps disease became an opportunity in another way. Stay at home orders creating weeks of quarantine and isolation perhaps gave space for the anger to build and people to realize that no matter the risk, the possible rewards for freedom were bigger. I don't know. Historians and others will interpret this moment with the privilege of greater distance than I have. Furthermore, due to my own underlying health condition against my political sensibilities, I've sat these protests out, quarantining for months now in my comfortable East Austin home with my partner and animal companions. What I do know is that AIDS has and always will have lessons for moments when the alienizing nation violently or subtly enacts its logic. We will be well served by learning them and more importantly, drawing on them to confront whatever we face. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for that. Um, that was really amazing. I, I was vigorously writing down notes throughout the whole um, talk. And so I actually, I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Um, if you want to take a second or two, I don't know, like grab some water or something, we can um, give some moments for our um, attendees to uh, put in their questions in the Q&A. Uh, I encourage all of you to do so, please. While we wait for questions to come in, um, I was not aware of one, uh, one of the things that you talked about, you talked about, mentioned earlier, um, of, of the Haitian immigrants that had been imprisoned in Guantanamo. And I was um, interested in, in to see if you could talk a little bit more about that particular um, situation. And um, you referred to the Haitian connection, which I thought was probably connected to that in some way. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, you know, the, the relationship between Haitians and AIDS in the United States is, is a long one, right? And uh, in 1982, the Centers for Disease Control named four high-risk groups for HIV. And this was based on their early kind of, you know, epidemi epidemiological information, which was uh, suggesting that four groups, for whatever reason, were more susceptible because in 1982, even though they had a good sense of what might be the cause of this thing, they didn't know it was a virus. Um, all they know is affecting certain groups. So those groups were homosexuals, uh, IV drug users or heroin users, um, hemophiliacs and Haitians. And so they were called the 4-H group kind of colloquially. Now, this was, I mean, if you know history of US-Haitian relationship, Haitians in the United States, obviously, this is uh, devastating to a community that's already severely maligned. And so you've got housing discrimination, I mean, you name it. Um, and also, they're the only national group named. The others are all named for things they do. Um, so blood transfusion, IV drug use, or a particular kind of sex. But Haitians, it was just who they are, right? Um, and so there was lots of uh, fights about this, you know, Haitian, lots of Haitian protests, etc. Um, and so uh, this was this persisted throughout the early years uh, of HIV AIDS. And so part of what I'm looking at initially is like, how was queer activist media really helping to challenge this? So uh, one of the chapters looks at the fact that um, there's this there was this newspaper called the New York Native, which was a, a gay newspaper in, in New York, um, and it only published every other week. And from about 1981 to 
uh, the like the end of the 80s, like 1990, um, it published the same number of articles about Haitians and AIDS as the New York Times did. And the New York Times, as we know, publishes daily, right? So they were really doing a lot of extra work on this. Um, so it's in some ways unsurprising, right, that all this discourse, negative discourse around Haitians, then uh, in 1991, Jean Bertrand Aristide is elected to president, democratically elected after, you know, a long sort of range of dictatorships through two different Duvalier regimes. Um, he's elected and, and very shortly after is overthrown. And so all these folks who had um, really worked to get him elected were now danger, in danger. So uh, they fled. And of course, if you know anything about immigration history with Haitians, um, Haitians are only considered economic migrants. There's no way to be a political refugee and be Haitian in this country. It's just like virtually impossible. And so even though all of these um, folks had been very politically active and were in grave danger, uh, the U.S. didn't want them to come to the United States. So they set up a processing center in Guantanamo Bay. Well, uh, some were sent to the United States because they had credible fear. Most were just sent back to Haiti. Who knows what happened? But there was a group of about 300 people who the U.S. government said were HIV positive and that they had a credible fear of persecution should they be returned to Haiti. Well, in 1987, the government passed a ban on HIV positive immigrants. Now, ostensibly that shouldn't have applied to refugees and asylum seekers, those should be different processes, but in practice, and because Haitians were gonna be the ones to test it, it did. And so you had folks languishing in what is universally described as concentration camp conditions for uh, almost, for over two years, well, almost two years, um, simply because of discriminatory HIV policy. And so there was all sorts of protests and hunger strikes and famous people in the US got involved to try and support the Haitian resistance on Guantanamo. Uh, but it's certainly, um, you know, people often describe it as like one of the darker times of US history, right? That racialized language. Um, but it's actually sort of par for the course. It just happens to be a really visible um, time. So that's a little bit about that for folks who don't know that history. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was not aware of that history. I was thinking as you were saying that I remembered, I am an immigrant myself, and I remember that one of the requirements um, for coming here was get having an HIV test, a negative um, result, and that was in the late 90s. So, yeah. um, you know, probably consistent with this same trajectory. Um, I'm still waiting for questions from the, from the audience. Um, you said, let me see, there were, there were a lot of quotes that I was trying to catch, um, which I'm glad you were reading from your book because that means they're already ready for me <laughs> to go back and pick up. But one of the things you talked about um, was uh, blackness, you said blackness resides at the center of the alienizing nation. I think that was a correct, direct quote. It might not have been a, uh, direct. Um, but I wanted to, uh, to see maybe have you talked a little bit more about that. I mean, it, it's clear when you were talking about the context of enslavement, right? And how in that, in that moment of, of civil war, but, um, and of course there's the constant um, fear of, of, you know, um, killing by immunity now, but I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about that within the context of disease, mm -hmm. if you could um, just, you know, if you have those thoughts. Um, yeah. I mean, there's so many things that come to mind. So one of the things is that uh, really the, the, the first quarantine stations in the United States, for example, um, were uh, African quarantines because they were where soon to be enslaved people were gonna be kept um, you know, in these pest houses uh, the probably most famous ones in um, Sullivan's Island in South Carolina. Um, and so, uh, you know, there was all these concerns about, you know, African disease. Um, and so sort of built into the way that we understand public health in this country, specifically when thinking about it in a global context, um, is, is fears about migration, but fears about uh, 
African disease, whatever that looks like. So, so that, that's one way. I mean, we think about the history of, of um, public health in this country, medical practice in this country, of course. Um, you know, uh, those practices were not just medical practices, they were nation building practices. And so there's reason why um, so much medical testing, so much um, of the kind of most egregious things that medical and public health professionals have done um, have targeted, especially black and indigenous folks. So that's another. The third thing we specifically start to talk about HIV and AIDS. Um, you know, we think about for those of us who are alive during the '80s and you know conscious. Um, you know, it was AIDS in Africa, AIDS in Africa, AIDS in Africa. So there was this fear about AIDS being then again a foreign disease that was coming here, uh, a foreign black disease that was coming here. But then in the United States itself, so that was sort of a fear, but in the US here, the images we saw were mainly white gay men. But when you start to look at um, who actually suffered the most from public health um, applications of quarantine, from legislative um, creations of quarantine laws, for example, uh, Almost in every instance, it was something created on the back of black sex workers, supposedly incorrigible, you know, black sex workers who weren't going to control their sexuality. So there's all these famous cases um, where this happened. And, um, and so I think you, you see this over and over and over again, that whenever there's sort of this opportunity to shore up the nation, to engage in a sort of national health project, health literally and metaphorical, um, it becomes this opportunity to pull blackness back into the center um, and, and to ensure that we know that sort of, doesn't matter if you're a citizen, right? That blackness is going to be this kind of other. And so, um, and I think, you know, the shortcoming of my book, I think uh, you could talk a lot about uh, indigeneity in ways that I'm not. I didn't see indigeneity. I didn't set out to write about blackness, to, to be really honest. I didn't, I thought I was just writing about immigration more broadly, um, but it just was there in everything when you start really digging into the kind of, uh, you know, primary sources on AIDS in, in that time period. So I don't know if that answers, but that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and it also is interesting too, because when you, I mean, this, all of this is interesting, but often um, in a lot of the national sort of discourse, when you, discussions around immigration, um, really focus on black immigrants, right? Like that's not the image um, that pops up when people are talking about immigration. So it's interesting that in that search, like as you were looking at immigration, that the, the what came up were, were were black immigrants. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I've I've seen from from some of your other work, and and you've mentioned today that you know a lot of times your focus. Um, is on looking at a lot of the resistance and activists work. And so I'm, and you mentioned obviously that the, the, the media, right? The, 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 the gay newspapers that were writing about this particular situation. And then also um, with reference to what was going on last summer and, and some of the activism, but I'm really interested to hear more about some the resistance work that was happening, um, as particularly in the context of um, with the, the Haitian situation and um, and AIDS activism. Yeah. Um, so you know, very early on, um, I mean, so so the my archive is incomplete. So I think it's important to, to state that up front. It's very hard to find. Um, a lot of material in any archives that collect Haitian materials that are, that I could find generally, but especially that I could find um, in English, um, that do say oral histories with Haitians living in the United States. So in Miami or New York, for example, um, or Haitian organization archives, a lot of this, these materials just don't exist. And so you rely on a lot of different kinds of sources to sort of imagine, figure out what's happening. Um, and so you had, um, Haitians were always resisting uh, their treatment by the US government. And so, um, you know, one of the 
largest protests was, um, I think in 1990, because Haitians were still not allowed to donate blood because of fears around HIV. And so um, somewhere between like 50 and 100,000 Haitians living in New York clo closed down the Brooklyn Bridge for several hours uh, in protest of their designation. Most people don't know that. It probably didn't hardly make the news back then. Um, and so you, you did have a lot of organizing, but the AIDS issue was challenging because it also brought up questions of homosexuality, um, which is very taboo. And so um, you had groups like ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, um, and organizations like Gay Men's Health Crisis, which was the earliest clinic for people living with AIDS in the country. You had these groups reaching out to Haitian leaders, to Haitian doctors to offer support in various ways. And, and, and there was really no interest, but when it came to um, what was happening at Guantanamo, something kind of opened up and it's hard to say what that was, but uh, you had um, in, in New York, you had the, the uh, Emergency Coalition for Haitian Refugees, which um, formed and you, know, you had queer folks in there, you had Haitians, you had African-American organizers, um, who were trying to draw attention to this, working closely with law students at Yale, um, the uh, Center for Constitutional Rights, who were taking on the legal case of this. And so you had this really fascinating formation of folks who were doing everything they could to not sort of take the limelight, but as I said before, the folks who were detained in Guantanamo, these were political organizers in Haiti. A lot of them were fluent in English. And they knew how to organize, like they knew what they were doing. And so they had a whole, you know, strategy. They were doing so much while they were detained. And really the organizers in the US, at least as far as the historical record shows, is they were working to just uplift those voices. Um, and so that they were leading the way. So it, it's a really powerful time um, for looking at how lots of people came together to, um, to address these issues. And there's, there's other examples in the book too, but that's probably the big one. Thank you. Um, I, I, I hate to monopolize your, all of your questions. I guess we could have these, this conversation offline if it's just the two of us chatting, but um, I have a lot of questions for you. Um, I'll ask a couple more and then if we're not seeing some more then we can just go ahead and let folks, I know, like I said, it's exam week so people are kind of sure. otherwise occupied. Um, you, you talked about this, when you're talking about the alienizing nation, one of the things that you talked about, the distinction between um, it not being predicated on being, but on doing, right? And then talking about how folks who would otherwise be identified or seen as strangers uh, being identified, I guess, as friends or whatever by doing white supremacy. I'm really fascinated by that idea as I think about it in, in sort of um, juxtaposition to some of the, you know, a lot of the writing that's that's been presented, or I guess a lot of the scholarship that's out about um, sort of like skin color, like the, the how some of some folks, right, specifically in this context, we're talking a lot about black folks, identifiably so, um, you know, our skins kind of serve as the borders, right? Like it's, it's one of the few things that is just, you know, and so how does that work for folks whose bodies, right, are, are so, you know, kind of the, the, at the center of the alienation, as you will, and the, uh, you know, as you, as you say, um, thinking about that and this concept of sort of uh, the doing being the primary method and not necessarily the identity. I don't know if that was a question, but that's, I was just thinking both of those things at the same time. No, it's important, right? Um, so who even has access to the doing? And part of what I'm trying to do um, with kind of putting these seemingly disparate things in conversation um, is, is to highlight that white supremacy is not just about white people. Um, and to highlight the fact that now, I mean, the truth of the matter is, right? And, and, and well, there's a couple of things. So one, like, you know, people of color, non-black people of color, non-indigenous people of color, as Jared Sexton calls us, are our junior partners to white supremacy, right? And I take that really seriously, that non-black Latinos are, um, you know, we, we, we do the bidding of white supremacy all the time. And I think 
that's what's fascinating about George Zimmerman um, in this way. And so part of what I'm trying to highlight is, is kind of just drawing attention to that, but really to say um, that this isn't just a black or white issue per se, um, and that nobody actually, it, it's not necessarily, any person of color who participates in that is not, um, it, it's a false promise, right? And so you can do that bidding, it's not for you. Um, and so this is kind of, you know, black conservatives, Latino Republicans, like down the line, you can do that bidding. And so we shouldn't be confused by that because it's, it is and it it is and is not about race in the sense of racial identity as much as it's about the racial power structure that constitutes the United States. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to play with there and kind of, a, I mean, the, the conclusion of the book is sort of written in this uh, sort of this tongue, tongue in cheek way, right, which is to um, say that whoever the actors are, the bottom line is this formation is fierce and strong and you're not gonna be included by doing it, but you can still do it and they're happy to have you do it, right? And people do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I will um, make sure to go ahead and pre-order the book. I encourage all of you to do so. <laughs> um, thank you uh, again, Dr. Chavez, for joining us today. Um, it was a really um, eye-opening presentation and uh, opened my mind up to a lot of things um, and historical facts that I just didn't didn't know. And so, um, thank you for that. I look forward to reading your book. Um, thank you to all of our audience members uh, for showing up today in the middle of exam week. Um, I appreciate you all. I encourage everyone to again, join us again in the fall when we come back and uh, be safe and uh, have a good summer of uh, those of you who are all done. Um, thank you, Dr. Chavez again. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity.